on there. Yep. My name is Terry L. Coop, T E R R Y L Coop, C O O P. And if you don't mind just saying hi, my name is Terry L. Coop. Hi, my name is Terry L. Coop. All right, Mr. Coop, where were you born? I was born in Muncie, Ball Hospital, 1960. When you were growing up, did you? Did you have uh, any notion of what Borg Warner was? Is that something that you knew of? When I was growing up, I knew all about Borg Warner because my father worked there. And I had an uncle that worked there, and uh, most of uh, the men in the neighborhood where I lived worked there, either there or one of the other local factories. Um, my mother still lives in that house, and it's about a mile east of Borg Warner. A lot of the men in my neighborhood actually walked to work. Did, uh, did your father, when he came home from work, did he talk about it? What kind of things did he say? Yeah, you know, um, he, he always had a few things probably to say about what was going on that day in the factory, you know. But uh, my dad was one of the guys who came up here in uh, 1950 from Tennessee looking for a job in the factories, you know. And uh, most of the men in my family came from Tennessee to come up here and go to work in the factories in the early 50s. And when did you uh, uh, get hired on at Board One? I got hired in January of 1979. Uh, it was not really what I had in my plans. I really didn't have a particular plan in mind. But uh, I'd been working in a local machine shop, and the opportunity to go to work there came up. And uh, they were hiring some people in the early 79, and I was one of the people that got in. Did your father help to uh, get you a job? I'm sure my dad helped because my dad had been there at that time. He'd been there probably 25 or 30 years. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Is yes. that pretty common in 1979 to have uh, have somebody on the inside kind of help you out to get That's, a job? That was very common uh, the whole time I worked at Borg Warner. Uh, there was a lot of uh, people in there that's children worked there or their wives worked in the office or whatever. A lot of, uh, and you know, that's good and it's bad. It makes your whole family dependent on one particular company or industry. Um, so it can have its pluses and its minuses. It can help your whole family, but if things turn bad, it, could, it can really mess up your whole family. I knew several people in there that their the husband and wife both worked there. So that could really, <laughs> could be good or it can be bad, you know. When, uh, now, now you worked right up to the very end, didn't you? Uh, actually, I left in, uh, at the end of June. Um, I was one of the guys that was laid off at the, uh, right before July 4th holiday. And uh, was able to draw unemployment for six months prior to my scheduled retirement date, which was January 1st, uh, 2009. When you uh, got hired, what kind of jobs did they have you doing? When I hired in there, I'd already worked uh, for a couple years at a local uh, job shop, machine shop, and uh, they had taught me uh, the basics of internal and external uh, grinding, surface grinding, things like that. And they had a department that that's what the, the whole department was, grinding operations. And I was able to go in there and pretty much pick up uh, uh, you know, right where I left off at the machine shop, just running more automotive type equipment. But uh, it was nice. That was one of the higher paying occupations in the place too that I was able to come into. Was uh, was that was that kind of unique? Uh, weren't mo many of the higher paying jobs dominated by people who worked there long? You kind of worked your way. Well, uh, seniority. Uh, uh, when you worked there, uh, seniority had its uh, benefits and probably had a few problems too, I don't know, but uh, the older people, uh, men and women, generally preferred to work a day shift so they could be home with their families in the evenings and stuff. And the younger people or people with less seniority uh, generally worked nights, afternoons or midnights, and I spent probably way more than half of my 30 years on afternoons or midnights. 
Uh, it's uh, interesting that that still affects my uh, um, daily routine. I tend to sleep late and stay up late still, uh, even after I've been out of there for a year. We talked a little bit about this off camera, but um, what were some of the really good and bad things, uh, the good things and then also the, the, the things that you didn't like about working at Board of Warner? Well, um, one of the best things was, you know, the people. Uh, you made a lot of friends um, over the years. And one of the worst things about the place was the people. You made a lot of people, not necessarily enemies, but people that you'd just rather not be around for whatever reason. And, but you were still forced to be around them every day. Uh, that's one thing about a long-term job in a, any kind of industry or any kind of company. Uh, after you're there 30 years, there's people that you don't particularly want to be around, and there's people that don't particularly want to be around you every day. You know, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> were, you, uh, were you active in the union that did, the, <laughs> did what you just described? Kind I of wouldn't say I was active in the union. Uh, I believed in the union uh, 100%. Uh, because the union not only helped you learn how to uh, do your job and protect your rights uh, as related to the company, but it also helped you maintain your rights as related to your other workers. Um, you know, you had seniority rights, and as I say, if you had more seniority than another worker, the unions what had you work in the, the better shift or, you know, um, if you had uh, an upgrade for another occupation, let's say, uh, seniority rights, if the two uh, candidates were equal in skill level, uh, I think seniority rights would probably be the, th the thing that would uh, prevail there, you know. So I believe that uh, uh, it was a good thing. Um, one of the things that uh, you saw a lot of from the union uh, perspective was community involvement. Uh, I would say that it, this senior citizen center wouldn't be here without the involvement of the working guys and, and girls, you know, in the community. Um, because they, they volunteer a lot of their time at these type places and it helps keep them running without a lot of tax dollars, you know. I think I told you this is the room that I went to kindergarten in. Did you, uh, did you yourself, were you active in some uh, community things that were associated with the union that the union pushed? Um, probably, I can't uh, think of a lot off the top of my head. Uh, I did go to the blood bank a few times. You know, there was a guy that uh, was always looking for people to donate to the blood bank. And um, United Way depended on our union uh, and the company too for a lot of contributions every year and I'm sure those contributions have dried up since it's gone but uh, uh, there, there was there were guys I worked with that had donated literally gallons and gallons of blood over the years you know that was that was kind of a big uh, big thing for some guys to see how many gallons they could donate before they retired you know um, I met a lot of good people over the years participate in the uh, Springwater Park type stuff, the picnics and the... They had uh, uh, Fourth of July, they would have an antique car display out there generally about every year and I would be involved in that with uh, displaying some of my antique cars or something like that. Um, oh, I can't really think off the top of my head how many community, how much community involvement. I, I was not one of the more involved guys in the community. Some of the guys that were really involved in that, uh, I think, uh, are still involved to this day uh, in the operation of this center and, and many other uh, community things like that in town here. It's quite, quite common. When you think back on the union and some of the bargaining sessions that you went through throughout 30 years, you know, for different contracts every couple of years, how would you view the effectiveness of the union in representing your interests over that time? And, and did it change over time? Well, uh, they were the only one representing my interests 
I can put it that way. Uh, you know, no one else is going to step up and represent you unless you are involved in a collective bargaining situation where you have, um, you know, people that can get together and share their ideas and and share their hopes and dreams and, you know, try to put a little bit of community uh, effort into making those come true. Probably uh, the biggest thing that I noticed in the 30 years that I was there is when I came in in 79, things were just, the auto industry was just starting to start to suffer from atrophy or whatever. And every contract that we had that I ever uh, saw, uh, for the most part, was a concessionary contract. We did things year after year after year to try to protect the retirees. Um, whether it was uh, giving up uh, wages or cost of living increases or paid holiday here or paid holiday there or something like that, uh, just so they would leave the retirees alone because most of the guys that worked there, guys and gals, had a retiree in their family. So. You know, we wanted to try to protect these folks. I'm sorry, I should have turned that off. Let me turn this off. But, uh... Where do you come down on, uh... You know, I, I know at the end there was a big split between kind of younger uh, people that work there and, and older people that, that were closer to retirement um, mm -hmm. and selling of the selling of benefits became a huge issue um, can you maybe explain that controversy and well I have limited knowledge of the, all that because I left before there was any you know I got laid off before there was much in the way of uh, buyouts and stuff talked about I know there was an initial proposal to offer buyouts to people uh, based on their years of service and stuff. But uh, in order to agree to these buyouts, we had to agree to uh, end all f current and future litigations that the company and the union may be involved in and uh, basically go ahead and let them cancel the retirees. That was my understanding, cancel the retirees, health insurance and stuff. And um, at the time they offered that, there were still enough people working there that would never be able to retire, would never make the, the enough time before the plant closing. There were still enough people there working that they could have probably got that voted through. A lot of these younger people that uh, hired in in the last 15 years or so, see, they didn't necessarily have a, a family member working in there. So they weren't as protective. It, it kind of goes back to our generation. That they say the me generation or whatever. It's all about uh, give me the money and uh, we'll worry about what happens to grandpa later. It's a sad thing, you know. Um, but that's the way society has become in some ways. Um, so, does that affect the strength of the union over the years? Oh, probably, there? yeah, probably, um, probably did in a great way, yeah. Yeah, one thing about my job, uh, my job in experimental, we were a closed area. You really weren't supposed to come in there, and we really didn't have much reason to go out in the plant. I went into experimental after I'd been there about 10 months. I spent about 10 months in a production environment. And then I was able to uh, put in a, uh, what's called an upgrade for another occupation. And since I would always, had always been involved in uh, antique cars or, or uh, custom cars and stuff like that growing up, um, I was kind of a natural to fit in in that department. But the reality of it is, the guy that ran the department and my dad played bluegrass music together. So I had an in. Now, that didn't mean that uh, uh, the union wouldn't have let me trample over some guy that had a lot more seniority than me and had equal skills in that type of work. 
but uh, most of the guys in the factory did not want to come down there and work in that experimental area because it had uh, different work rules and we were a separate bargaining unit from the rest of the company. Once you come down there and got the occupation, you could never go back to the factory. So even though I had 30 years of seniority in that 29 or whatever uh, in that department, I was uh, like the first or second, third guy from, the, from layoff for years and years and years. Where if I'd have been out in the factory, I'd have had hundreds of people under me. But I didn't want to stay out there. I wanted to go to the experimental department and actually help with the design and development and testing of the products. A lot more interesting, I thought. But there again, the, the, the fact that the two areas were somewhat separated, you, didn't, you weren't involved in a lot of the things that went on in the factory, and you didn't know a lot of the things that went on out there. So I'm probably not a good one to ask too many questions about that aspect of it, probably. Do you think that was fairly common? Do you think that uh, that people tended to group together and you know the, the guys who were around them every day? You had a, a core group of a couple, couple ten guys that you saw in the rest of the factory. Was just... That was fairly common because you know you had a break area. You'd have a picnic table and a break area, a place where you could sit down. You had twelve minute breaks every couple of hours. Uh, twelve minute in the morning and then a twenty six minute or something like that at lunch and then twelve minutes in the afternoon. So you really didn't have time to go far. And if you were really, if you're working production, you didn't take that first break because the very nature of the beast was you wanted to be ahead by lunch. After lunch, you don't want to try to be playing catch up. You don't want to, you know, you want to try to get out ahead in the morning and make sure things are running smooth and get uh, more than your, you, you know, more than your quota by lunch and then in the afternoon if your machine starts breaking down or you run out of parts or something, you're able to still keep your quota up, you know, and because uh, if you, if they want a thousand gears out of you, you got to get a thousand gears or they're not going to be able to make a thousand transmissions at the other end of the line. So one, one little part missing can hold up the whole thing, see. And we made a lot of different products, so there was a lot of different pieces being made by a lot of different people going a lot of different directions all at the same time. So I felt like that uh, my father's generation, the World War II generation or whatever you call them, I, you know, and it could have been my perception as a young man, but I felt like the place operated like a well-oiled machine when uh, when all these older gentlemen and, and ladies were in there. And then as they started retiring, things started just, you know, we lost that knowledge base. Uh, and that's probably a natural fact that, of gentrification of an industry, but you know, you, you can't lose all that knowledge base all at one time and still made, you know, design and develop a product that's gonna be viable. Were there a lot of ladies when you hired in? in a lot of women there. A lot of women worked out there. And a lot of women went to work in there after World, at, uh, you know, around World War II. And uh, there was a lot of women worked there. I met a lot of great women who worked in there. And, uh, you know, when we'd have like a uh, Christmas dinner or something, you know, you had to help, you had to depend on these gals to bring in something that was fit to eat, you know, because the guys, <laughs> When most of us, we couldn't cook much, you know, so. Uh, were, were there ever any problems with uh, with women being, I don't know. I mean, you, you think of a factory as kind of being a, a crude environment in a lot of ways, you know. No, I think, uh, I can only think of a couple instances in all those years when uh, I heard that a woman had been insulted by another worker. I'm sure it happened, but uh, no, that was not a, an issue that I ever saw. Uh, uh, the female employees, they might have a different answer for that, but uh, most of the men in there had wives, had daughters, you know. You're not gonna do stuff like that. So I don't really think that was an issue. Sexual harassment was not an issue. Uh, there were a few, few guys that, you know, 
that the women probably stayed away from, but I, I never saw or heard of anyone being uh, fired or charged with sexual harassment. It may have happened, but I don't know about it. There again, my department was all men. See, there was no women in my department, so, and the, the group that I had worked around all those years was about, started out to be about 60 people and it slowly dwindled and dwindled and dwindled to the end there. There was about five of us left, you know. But I liked the experimental because of the variety of the pro uh, products and the variety of tests that we ran on the products. If you were in the production line out there, you were making gears every day or making holes in gears every day or you were, you know, some of the jobs, some of the jobs that uh, people had out there, uh, really the environment that they had to do them in was horrible. And I've seen a lot of people have a lot of health consequences from that. Uh, oil poisoning was real common. You run equipment that uses oil for coolant and, and cutting lubricant, and that oil turns into a spray, and it just would permeate the air and it would eventually get all over everybody's skin and it would cause them to break out in a rash. And it's, a, it's a, some type of a skin poisoning. And uh, there were areas, uh, and you know, that was one thing that improved over the time. You know, in the last 20 years, environmentally, the place improved a lot, you know. But I can remember in the early days when I first worked there that if it uh, came a big rain, the place would flood. And uh, the floor was made out of wood blocks set on concrete. And these wood blocks would all just float all over the place and, and they would be just oil soaked and it was, it was a nasty place. But that improved a lot towards the end. And a lot of that was the type of equipment. The, your newer equipment is self-contained. New manufacturing qu uh, equipment is self-contained and it, it controls the, the mists and stuff, and you use different solvents probably what you used early on. That's one thing that I can tell you for sure that uh, in my area, we use trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene as cleaning solvents, and they're both known carcinogenics. And uh, the last 10 years or so, we were able to get rid of that stuff and uh, go to a product called Safety Clean, I think it was. But my department lost probably a dozen men with cancer in the, in the 10 years, in the, in the, let's say five or six years before I came in there, the guys were dropping like flies. And it was because they were just constantly exposed to trichloroethylene. Trichloroethylene is basically cleaning, a dry cleaning solvent. Did the company step up and take care of those guys? Um, well, they had insurance, health insurance and stuff, you know. They were handled through the regular system. But uh, I don't know that there was ever a link. You know, maybe there was. I, I wasn't involved. Uh, there again, the union had health and safety representatives and environmental guys that, and gals that looked at that kind of stuff, you know, and tried to make the workplace a safer environment, and the company did too. I mean, you know, they had a vested interest. They don't want all their employees dying off either, <laughs> you know, so. But uh, those chlorinated solvents were a bad, bad thing. When you were out there, were you ever, uh, you mentioned being the low man on the totem pole in your department for quite a while. Were you ever laid off? Yeah, I was laid off in, uh, I think it was, uh, oh, I don't know, it was in the early 80s. I was laid off for about a year. Yeah, when the auto industry was really at its, uh, one of its slumps, you know. I was laid off for about a year, year and a half. And I took those internal and external grinding skills that I'd learned at the Reaver Machine and at Borg Warner and went to work at a local uh, hard chrome shop doing internal and external grinding. You know, so the skills were able to, were marketable skills, you know. Now, when I went into experimental, that is more of a glorified mechanics job, so the only marketable skill that you really have coming out of there is as a mechanic. Not too many people want you to, 
take their car to the drag strip for you know six months and beat its brains out, you know, which was common work in the experimental. One of the uh, more interesting tests that we did in experimentals, we had a, a, a semi trailer with the wheels taken off. It was a freezer trailer, and we could actually put vehicles in there and freeze them and then try to drive them, try to operate them. It didn't matter if it was a car or a truck or a fork truck or whatever it was. And most mechanical things don't like to operate when they're 40 below. You know, like your brakes, things like that. But as soon as you pulled the vehicle out of there, the windows would frost over and the seats were like sitting on an ice cube. And it was interesting tests, you know. <laughs> we did a lot of different kinds of tests. We made a lot of different products. You know, we made products there for, for boats, fork trucks, backhoes, tractors, cars, trucks, you name it. I mean, really, if it, if it had an engine in it and you have to have some way to connect the engine to the wheels, Borg Warner at one time or another made the product to connect the dots. Now, I know at the end that, that, that really changed and all you were making were transfer cases. Yeah. Um, when, can you kind of go through the progression, how that changed? I mean, what dropped off? and. Well, the marine and industrial stuff, I think, uh, best I remember, I could be wrong on this timeline, but the, the marine and industrial stuff started vanishing first, and it's my understanding that stuff still made in Europe someplace. Uh, they had a, a series, a couple different series of uh, marine transmissions that were very, very easily adaptable to industrial use. People really wouldn't think about it, but a fork truck and a small boat probably have the same transmission in them. Or a backhoe and a boat. They use the same type transmissions. One of the things that we did with uh, backhoes was actually hook a truck transmission to a boat transmission. Took the reverse out of the truck transmission, so you had four gears in the truck transmission and you had the boat transmission that would go forward or reverse. So you had basically four forward speeds and four reverse, uh, four reverse speeds just by hooking the two together. You'll find those in uh, a lot of backhoes and stuff to this day. And almost bulletproof stuff, you know, you can't hardly break it. Uh, if you think about a fork truck, a fork truck and a boat operate almost the same way. There's no brakes on a boat. So when you want to slow that boat down, you put it in reverse. So when you're coming up to the dock, you try to slow down, you put the boat in reverse. Fork trucks are the same way. You pull up to a load and, and you know, a lot of fork truck drivers, they, you know, they get used to not even hitting the brakes. They pull up to the load and jam it in reverse as they're picking the load up and off they go. They get to where they're setting it down and they set it down and jam it in reverse and take off the other way. Same thing. Did you guys take a lot of pride in the, in the products you were building out there? Yes, they did. Yes, they did, because we've had, uh, uh, gosh, I imagine probably, I think, four different uh, vehicles uh, that we made the transmissions for paced the Indy 500. Many of the vehicles that actually were in the 500 were driving with transmissions that came out of our factory and went into production cars. Um, I'm not sure of, uh, of these particular makes, but when you go back and look in these old cars like uh, Marmons and Hudsons and Packards and Cords and Duesenbergs and stuff like that, you're gonna find a lot of Warner transmission products. If it's not the clutch or it's the transmission, if it's not the transmission, it'll be the drive shaft. If it's not that, it'll be the rear axle. I know that we did a uh, driveline restoration on a, on a Auburn, uh, coupe one time for uh, uh, Mr. Larry Prather, a local businessman, uh, and they had it in the Great American Race. And uh, the guys uh, in Experimental were very proud of the effort that they were able to bring that uh, car in and blueprint the transmission, make sure everything was perfect in it before they took off on this big race in this old uh, Auburn. It was a 32, I think, Auburn. So, you know, people think of Auburn, Cords, and Duesenbergs as some of the most expensive uh, classics out there, and many of those had Warner gear transmissions in them. Now, uh, you talk about pride uh, within the part, 
you know, the parts that were built out there. Was there also pride uh, being in Muncie? Was there a feeling that uh, that it was important to Muncie to have Four Warner here? Um, well, I, I really couldn't answer to that because uh, you know, depend on who you talk to, I suppose. But Muncie's a blue collar town, and uh, most of the men and women here that worked in these factories, or at least a large portion of them, came from the South. And uh, people in the South are known for pride and worth ec uh, work ethic, you know. Um, there's, a, there's a lazy person there, you know, on any corner. But uh, the majority of the people that I've met in my lifetime here in Muncie are hardworking, honest people. I do believe that. When you were out and about, and this maybe you didn't ever get a reaction from people, but you said you worked at Board Warner. Did you? Did uh, you know? We, we've heard some folks say that, that you guys were known as being a little spoiled. Uh, did you? Did you get that sense, or did you? Well, get sense of uh, how you were viewed. Yes and no. Um, there's always going to be someone who has animosity towards someone who they feel has a better uh, stake in life. And uh, one of the things that we did that uh, probably was a mistake uh, years ago as uh, factory workers and union members and guys that were able to uh, enjoy a better standard of living is maybe flaunt it somewhat, you know. Uh, if your neighbor's got a junky car and you've got a brand new one, you've got an animosity autom automatically building between you and your neighbor. Your neighbor doesn't like the fact that you can afford a new car and he can't. Um, but um, in the same sense of the word, if your neighbor had a problem with his septic tank, you'd be over there helping him dig it up. I do remember that in my neighborhood as a kid, everyone's house was on a septic tank. And it seemed like that they were constantly digging up somebody's septic tank. And so the, in the evenings, most of the men who worked at all these local factories, many of them at Borg Warner in my neighborhood, they would, uh, they would get together in the evenings and do whatever it was that needed to be done on any one particular person's property. And if they had a lucky night where they didn't have to dig up somebody's septic tank or patch their roof, um, they'd play horseshoes. But uh, they didn't want the young kids hanging around. You know, they'd always run us off. But uh, those guys would uh, lean on each other for support as far as that goes. Do you think Board Warner as a company, uh, were they very active in the community? Um, we talked about the union a little bit with some of their drives. Oh, I don't, I really don't know, you know, because I wasn't part of that arm. They did and get involved in some probably golf outings and stuff like that, and and they were involved in United Way drives and probably the blood drives and things like that. And I'm sure they were they had their share of community involvement. Um, that would uh, probably mostly come from a local level. War Warner changed a lot when the. the uh, headquarters of our outfit really kind of moved from here to Detroit or up Sterling Heights, wherever it is. Um, that probably had a negative effect on us as a company and related to the community. You know, we still have the Borg Warner Trophy in Indianapolis, but as far as I know, there's no Borg Warner uh, employees left in, in Indiana. Maybe there's a handful out there still packing up paperwork, but I don't, you know, and, and maybe there's a place that I don't know about, possibly that, but the decision's been made a long time ago by uh, a lot of companies, including Borg Warner, to move away from heavy industries into lighter industries, I think. Uh, it's a lot easier to make uh, probably light bulbs than it is uh, Sherman tanks, you know. And there's just as many people needing light bulbs as there are needing Sherman tanks these days. So it's probably a uh, it's probably an easier business climate to work with. You know, you can come out with a new light bulb, but it's kind of in six months. But it, it'd take you six years to come up with a new tank. So I think that has something to do with that. Did you uh, uh, 
recognize early on or, or earlier than you know, maybe at around 2000 or, or whenever that the company was making plans to leave or seemed to be? We all knew that in the mid-90s. How'd you know that? When they moved the transmission business out of there and left a hole in the half the plant was basically vacant. Uh, and moved to, they moved to engineering offices to Detroit, product, de product design and stuff out of there. When they started moving stuff out of there in the mid-90s, it was obvious to anybody that had a brain that the place was on its way out. And you know, all you had to do is look around, too, you know. Um, one of our more famous transmissions was the T10 four-speed that we came out with in mid-57. And it set the automotive world on end. Everybody had to have a four-speed. And nobody had a four-speed in a, in a sports car type uh, vehicle at that time. Even, you know, you could get a three-speed, even a Corvette. Mid-57, they came out with the four-speed in the, in the Corvette. Immediately, people were running down to the dealer and buying one over the counter and putting it in their passenger car because you couldn't get one in the passenger car. And uh, they'd cut a hole in the floor and take it off the column and put it on the floor. You know, everybody wanted a T10 four-speed. And the, the volume got large enough that by the uh, mid-63, I think it was, that the uh, Chevrolet Muncie transmission plant over here started producing basically their own version of the T10. They called it the Muncie four-speed. And anybody that has ever watched an auto auction on TV, sooner or later, there'll be a Corvette or a Camaro or something roll through there and it's got a Muncie four-speed in it. And that's where they all came from was the Muncie Chevrolet plant down here on A Street. I don't know if you've been down there, but it's completely gone. There's nothing left. The building and everything's gone. But uh, they made the Muncie until I think 77. And then the uh, production dropped low enough that they came back to Borg Warner and wanted to know if they could get the T10 back. Sure enough, they were still making the T10. And uh, they upgraded a few things to make it stronger, to handle these uh, stronger engines that were out there these days, and came out with the Super T10. The Super T10 to this day is still made, I think, by Richmond Gear. And you can still buy one out of any automotive magazine. They're about $1,600, $1,800 a piece. And we were probably selling them to GM back then for three or 400 a piece, you know. But uh, if you want a four-speed, that's still about the most bulletproof piece you can get. And there's very, very little difference in the design of it and what we had in 57. And uh, tremendous product. Same way with the T5 that they came out with in the, oh, uh, I guess the early 80s. And it was used in Mustangs and Camaros and S trucks and you know, everything you can think of. Very, very versatile transmission. And I know one of the engineers, a uh, local guy that was very instrumental in the total design of that thing. And uh, it's still a good unit to this day. But they quit making that, you know, because uh, vehicles change too. You know, as vehicles evolve, the driveline evolves, you know. When I was uh, a kid, everybody had a 427 engine, you know. And now you got an engine in your car that's maybe a third that size, you know. Nobody wants a gigantic 427 engine these days. You can't afford to feed it. And engine management, computerized engine management, will make that new engine more efficient than that big old 427. So when, uh, when innovation kind of left Muncie and they, and they moved development out, and you had a good idea that, that they were they were gearing down the plant, they were going to close. What kind of things did you did you do to prepare yourself uh, for that eventuality? Mm -hmm. Really, the only thing that uh, a prudent person would do would be not to overextend yourself. Uh, when you saw the plant was, uh, when it felt like in the early mid '90s that the plant was possibly uh, going to suffer the same fate that many other uh, industrial plants in this area have suffered. You didn't go out and buy you a gigantic boat or something, you know. You didn't go out and buy that biggest house you could find. Uh, you tried to use your head in that aspect, you know. 
and not be overextending yourself if you felt like the thing was uh, going to be a problem down the road. 30 years in one building is a long time. I knew men out there that had 50 years in that place. And spending 30, 40, 50 years in one building, in one job, in one place, that was a great idea and a great thing for our uh, predecessors in uh, America, but I'm not sure it's a good idea as a whole. It really stifles you, it stifles the community, it stifles creativity, but uh, it did a lot for uh, security, family security and community security. Oh, I don't know. <clears throat> um, in your interactions on a daily basis out of the plant, um, what was your, what kind of impressions can you give me of your, of your, uh, labor management relations during the time you were out there? Uh, the very first uh, plant superintendent that I had was uh, such a well-respected man. This was a company guy, this wasn't a union guy, <coughs> that um, no matter what you needed done, he could get it done. And I respected him for that because the reason he could get things done is the men respected him. <clears throat> the men and women. Uh, you work for somebody, you work harder for somebody that respects you and you respect them. And uh, uh, Austin Patterson was this gentleman's name. His son actually uh, <coughs> ended up working there also in the plant and uh, I believe he ended up retiring. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and when my wife and I at the time uh, decided to name our son, uh, we were looking through names and uh, the name Austin popped up and that was he was the only Austin I'd ever met. And I thought, yeah, I could go with that. You know, you couldn't name your son after someone that you had no respect for, you know, uh, the Unabomber or something. You would not want to name your child after, you know, a career criminal or something, you know. Um, but uh, he was a great man and he was well respected by a lot of people. And I met a lot of guys and, and women like that that were well respected by the workforce. And I met a few, you know, that people hated them. And it seemed like they put them in there just to be in the way. I never could understand some of that, you know. But it wasn't my job to figure out, you know, I, I wasn't working in human resources and that wasn't my thing. My job was to test and develop products and that's what I did. So I live, left it up to someone else for the most part to decide who was going to be a, a candidate for a management position or whatever. Um, I don't know, uh, in, the, in America, in a general, occasionally People aren't necessarily put in positions because of their knowledge, you know, or their ability to get anything done. Uh, the one that comes to mind is uh, President Bush put the head of the uh, Horse Breeders Association in charge of FEMA, and then that's what you got when Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina hit. You had a guy that really knew nothing about infrastructure, real estate, anything, emergency management. He knew how to breed racehorses, and you can't do that. You can't put a uh, you know a guy that knows hot air balloons in charge of a nuclear facility. You know you're gonna have a problem. <laughs> so is that something that you saw at the factory, both in management and and uh, yes. the workers were workers placed in the right spots? Mm, not always, okay. um, not always. You know, but the workers had a. Uh, had an option there if uh, let's say if you upgraded to a new occupation you had six months to accept that occupation or decline it and it gave you six months to decide whether or not you were capable of doing that job and whether you were going to enjoy doing that job and whether you were going to enjoy the co-workers that you were going to be spending you know a lot of time with and sometimes people uh, 
t uh, left jobs that they were skilled at and qualified for just because they necessarily didn't like their coworkers. Or sometimes people, I'm sure, stayed in jobs that they felt that they were challenged by, but they felt that they had the support of their coworkers. So human nature, you know, is what it is, you know. So you do what you can to feel productive and to be content, you know. Uh, but I, I saw a few people in, in all facets of my life that <laughs> inside of Borg Warner and outside of Borg Warner that, you know, you felt they would be better served in another position or something, you know. Were you a, uh, uh, do you remember the strike of 89 much at all? I remember the strike of 89 very well. Uh, the uh, strike of 89 was basically, uh, as best uh, I recall it, they were trying to cancel the retirees' health insurance then. And the reason I know that is my dad was laying out at the hospital dying. <sighs> and they wanted to cancel his insurance. And luckily, um, we were able to eventually reach a contract that kept these old guys safe. But uh, my dad died later that year. We weren't, um, I don't recall any negotiations where we were looking for raises or more days off or anything like that in the 30 years I worked there. I, I don't recall any. Excuse me. No, they were always about preserving the retirees' benefits. Every time. Um, and I think that we were able to do that. You know, um, the last contract that we had right before the plant closed. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of uh, flap in the newspaper about it because I think both sides really wanted to keep it kind of quiet. But um, uh, some people will easily say that, uh, oh, we, you know, we drove the company out of here and all this stuff, the company being the union. But uh, the last negotiations that that we had right uh, before the announcement of the plant closing, we gave up uh, uh, overtime after eight hours. We used to get overtime. If you worked more than eight hours, you'd be on time and a half. And uh, we gave that up and went to overtime after 40 hours, which is what uh, kind of became the standard in uh, the world. And we gave up uh, several things, uh, you know, uh, cost of living adjustments to our wages and many of these things, just to try to keep the company off these union, these retirees one more time, you know, because there's guys uh, that, you know, have retired from out there, still out here floating around that's in their 90s, you know, and it's, it's tough to see these people suffer, you know, so I don't know. I met a lot of great people there though. And uh, a lot of them uh, had a lot of positive effect on my life. You mentioned being a family man. Uh, was, it a, was it a good 
place to work if you had a family? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, women tend to know each other and know each other's families. Uh, and if you were a family person uh, to work there, uh, was good because uh, you guys, you know, we knew that uh, that look, this guy's going to need to take a, a vacation day on Friday because he's got to take his child to the doctor, you know. So the rest of us are going to have to step up and and help get this project that he's working on done, you know, because he's not going to be able to be here for a day or two, you know. And that was common. Uh, but like I say, the women all knew each other. They knew each other's husbands' names. They knew where they lived. They knew their kids' names. Guys, we're not that way. We, we, for the most part, don't even know their our coworkers' wives' names. We don't know their children's names. We're lucky if we know where they live because you know we didn't. A lot of us didn't socialize outside the plant. Just the few that you did, you would know their information about their families. You know, but. Uh, uh, there was one gentleman uh, that I'd like to mention named uh, Kenneth Ivey. And Kenny uh, has a huge family. Uh, some of his, I think at least one or two of his sons uh, worked at Borg Warner. Kenny worked there uh, uh, when, the, when I hired in there. He was in experimental. Kenny uh, was, a, was an elder of a local church, very well respected in the community. And... Uh, he was the kind of guy you could always go ask questions. And he'd give you a straight answer, you know. And that's that 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 was a good thing. But uh, if you could find any of uh, Kenny's family to talk to, it'd be there was other guys in the plant that were pastors of local churches or whatever that uh, we're good, you know, to help, but uh, he was top in my book. Um, yeah, you know, it's painful seeing uh, a company like Borg Warner leave, but uh, it's a sign of the times. Um, you know, unless we can figure out how to uh, produce things for, you know, a dollar an hour and not have any uh, environmental concerns or uh, wage, uh, what's the world I, uh, word I'm looking for, child labor laws, all the things that we became accustomed to in the United States. Uh, believe me, if it wasn't for uh, a concerted effort by organized labor, you would not have. Child labor laws is one of the biggest ones. Uh, my son, is a graduate from uh, Miami School of Business at Miami University at Oxford, Ohio. And he told me that they studied the fact that in uh, rural America in the farming days, when you dug a water well, you, you used the kids to dig the well because you didn't want the well falling in on the patriarch of the family and killing him. You could lose a kid or two, you could make a new one. But you didn't, you didn't tie a rope around dad's legs and lower him down in there with a shovel and a bucket. You'd put the you know, 10, 12 year old boys down in there, literally tie a rope on them and lower them in the hole. And you know, throw some bricks down here, put these on the walls while you're digging the hole. And many emerging nations uh, still to this day use children to, you know, to manufacture their products. And uh, it's well documented that this goes on around the world and we as American consumers, we participate in that by buying the product. Uh, if you know darn good and well that a child has been working, uh, you know, 60 hours, 80 hours a week making those blue jeans, why would you want to put a pair on? It's beyond me. So. I do my best along with a lot of the other guys that I, and women that I worked with all these years to buy locally grown produce, to buy uh, products that are made in the United States. Um, and I do believe that if it wasn't for a, a, a 
consumer groups and, and organized labor groups and groups like that that actually care about some of these issues, uh, you know, we would all be buying everything we could get from an underdeveloped nation if we can get them, you know, if, uh, if we can get them to work for a penny a day, you know, we'll do it uh, as a society and that's sad. We should not be that way. Um, but we do that. So consumer awareness, I think, has something to do with some of that. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I said, you know, the, well, it was at the bank, actually, at one of the local bankers. And I said, the reality of the, of the mentality that if I'm going to lose my job, I don't need to worry. I'm going to go ahead and buy myself a new car, and if I lose my job, they'll take it back. The reality of it is, if you think you're about to lose your job, the last thing on earth you ought to be doing is going out and buying you a new car. You should be fixing up the old car and trying to save some money. But we are enticed by these idea that, eh, go ahead and buy that new car. You know, you got nothing to lose. You have nothing to gain either. So when the companies then, like, these Korean car makers are basically dumping these cars on our shores. And these are terms that you used to hear back when I first started working at Borg Warner. You'd hear product dumping cases come, you know, people talking about them. You don't hear that now. You know, they've got all these cars already offloaded in California. They can't take them back to Korea. There's no one there to buy them. So they decided, well, we'll just give them out to the American public and they're dumb enough to take them. So now the American auto industry are, are on that bandwagon too, you know, offering, they've had insurance companies that will stand up and say, look, we'll insure the value of that car uh, against the possibility of this person losing their job. I definitely we're, steered we're, my son away from, uh, are you rolling on that? Uh, my son, uh, I steered him away from being involved in the auto industry. Uh, he's quite active in the uh, auto hobby, just like myself with our antique cars and our hot rods. And uh, we restore some old motorcycles and stuff like that. But I steered him away from the auto industry as a whole. Uh, because I felt like that, you know, it's going to struggle for years to come. And uh, he pursued, a, you know, like I say, a degree in business so that uh, his major was organizational leadership. So he could really function leading any kind of an organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be an auto industry related organization. I have a nephew that is involved in the auto industry and he struggles. You know, to, uh, he works for Delphi, and it's, it's a you know, day-by-day -day thing with them. But uh, I definitely did not want my son to be uh, involved in the auto industry as an, in an engineering capacity or whatever, um, because I felt like it's still a volatile industry. And he was, uh, like myself, quite interested in real estate. I have a, uh, I hold a real estate broker's license, have for years, and to help me uh, manage my real estate investments, and he was in, <laughs> interested in that, but the real estate industry's kind of tanked now too, you know? And it's really not because they've made more land, it's because we've uh, really messed up our financial markets where nobody can really get the money to buy real estate the way they would like. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, when we when we spoke on the phone, you referred to, uh, you have investment properties that you rent out basically to students generally. Yeah, I've done that for 30 years. I bought the first property in September of 79 after I'd worked at Borg Warner after, for nine months, eight or nine months. And you, uh, you'd asked me if I was ever laid off. I was laid off the day before I bought my first piece of property. Uh, I'd been working at Borg Water for eight, about eight or nine months, and I decided to buy two little houses over by the local Ball State uh, University, and, and I thought, I'll rent one and live in the other. And I was laid off the night before. 
But I went ahead and went to the closing and I came out of the closing with two properties and $19 in my pocket and no job. And I moved uh, myself into one house, rented the other house and got called back to Board Warner two weeks later. So I was only all laid off for two weeks. So, you know, if they need you now, if they don't need you for two weeks and then need you again, Boy, you're riding a really sharp edge of a knife there, you know. I mean, they might not need you again for <laughs> in two more weeks. You might be back out the door. That's the feeling that you had. But um, the local real estate market has suffered tremendously by the loss of industry in this town and all the jobs because the real estate taxes have quadrupled on all my properties. Um, now most of the properties that I own here in town are around campus are $60,000 houses and they're $250 to $300 a month just to pay the taxes and insurance. When, when you bought these, did you see this as being kind of a uh, supplement to your retirement plan? Yeah, I felt like that uh, I, would, I would eventually be able to retire uh, with these properties as a good supplement to my uh, Borg Warner retirement, and it may still be, you know, but it, it uh, it's going to be a struggle now that the uh, real estate taxes have gone crazy. Um, most of those houses out there are two to three thousand a year, the real estate taxes on a sixty thousand dollar house. That's a lot of tax money going out. Did most guys at Borg Warner have? Uh, have other plans and everybody I worked with at Borg Warner it seems like had a second job or a side job or a backhoe or a bulldozer or they cleaned out septic tanks or they did carpentry work on the side or they did roofing or they did mechanic work uh, everybody had seemed like you know I knew guys that had farms you know and small farms and they would uh, try to raise a few cattle or pigs or whatever there were guys that uh, had uh, chickens and they would actually bring eggs in there and sell them uh, to their coworkers, you know. The guys would, in the morning, they'd stop and pick up, uh, you know, some eggs and take them in and put them in the refrigerator and have a, you know, egg sandwich for lunch or whatever, you know. But uh, my dad, when he uh, uh, worked all those years at Borg Warner, uh, and my dad worked 39 and a half years to get 30 years seniority to retire on because he was laid off so many times and the years ago the seniority did not continue on while you were laid off. And so it took him almost 40 years to get 30 and to retire. But he repaired televisions and radios on the side. And uh, that was a pretty common thing, you know, people, uh, when TVs were full of tubes, these tubes would go out and you'd have to have a TV guy come over and test the tubes in it, see which one was bad and put a new tube in it and your TV would start working again. That was very common. Can you, um, would you mind talking a little bit about the personal significance to you uh, and your family uh, of, of the Borg Warner closing? How, how exactly does, does losing this job affect you? Um, I had every intentions of leaving that place uh, as soon as my retirement was available to me in January. Uh, it kind of put me into motion six months ahead of time because about a year before the place closed, they just decided that they weren't going to test any more of their products. They were just going to build them and ship them. And uh, they basically uh, stopped the development from our end on any of our products that we were making and just decided, I guess, that they were good enough. And uh, so I had already been planning to leave, you know. Um, and, uh, and that's another thing about the area that I worked in. We generally worked 40 hours a week. We didn't work Saturday, you know, much overtime, unless it was needed. If they needed overtime, we could work around the clock, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day in that, that department, but it happened very seldom. Only when we were trying to uh, concentrate on the development of a new product or we had a major 
quality issue that popped up and we they would throw all resources at it to, to find out the problem and what was causing it and how to fix it. It might be a heat treat issue, it might be a, you know, a, something in manufacturing, a hole's getting put in the wrong place and we got to figure out why. But uh, for the most part, uh, 40 hours a week, you know, uh, did gave me a decent income, but there were a lot of people in the factory that worked six days a week every week. Uh, and they would work a Sunday or whatever, even a double shift if they could. And when you got used to living on six days a week or, you know, seven days a week worth of pay and you suddenly lose your job, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get used to than if you're just working 40 hours a week. So I tried not to overextend myself by living above my means to the point where I would be so affected when it finally happened. But I was already planning to retire when my retirement date came, which would be January of 2009. I really wanted to work 29 days more. I wanted to work 30 years and 29 days just so I would have the same amount of retirement time my dad had. Don't know why. <laughs> it's something to think about. But, you know, the, all these companies, uh, they brought good wages and good income to these uh, uh, blue collar guys and gals. And uh, it's gonna be hard to replace that you know, um, all of us can't uh, work at Walmart. You know, I don't. I don't shop at Walmart. You guys weren't around to see it, but I remember Sam Walton coming on TV all the time. Buy American, buy American. That was his thing. Buy American. As soon as Sam Walton died, Walmart went in another direction, and so completely. It was all like, okay, now we got to satisfy the shareholders. And when America decided to abandon long-term growth and long-term viability of their companies for short-term profits just related to the stock price, uh, I think we were on a, a bad path right there. That's my personal opinion anyway. I saw the other day a commercial that said you could move a ton of goods by train for 431 miles on a gallon of gas. I may have those numbers off a little bit, but it was over 400 miles on one gallon of fuel. The reason we don't move things by train anymore is because we have just-in-time philosophies that say that just as soon as that product is manufactured, we need to get it to the marketplace and get it sold and get it into use. And we don't want it sitting around in a warehouse. We don't want more than a few days between the time that we manufacture this product and get it into use. But uh, if we can manufacture it for almost nothing, we can go ahead and bring it in and let it set in cargo containers until a semi can come over and pick that thing up and run it over to the warehouse and that warehouse can quickly disperse it. Uh, just in time philosophies I think have hurt the American worker. What kind of uh, what kind of future do you see for Muncie? Muncie's going to struggle for quite a while, I think. Uh, you know, we still have a gap between the gown and the town. Uh, you guys have pinpointed that many times. I think uh, the differences between the what goes on north of the tracks and what goes on south of the tracks, and. Uh, as recently as in today's paper, they decided, well, we don't want to put any parking meters in the downtown area, but we can put some more of them up around Ball State. Well, the Ball State students are here for four years and then they're, you know, they graduate and they move on or whatever. But the uh, local people that might have to stick a quarter in that parking meter downtown, they stay here and vote. So. We can, and I've seen it in the 30 years I've been running my student rental uh, business out there, I've seen it, it's, it's quick to go towards the student population to raise money if they have to, or uh, aggravate the student population with some type of a law or something that they won't even uh, 
make any effort to enforce anywhere south of the south of the river. Um, so there's a lot of politics involved in those decisions too, I'm sure. But um, is there anything else you'd like to add to, to wrap this up about your time at Board Warner? Just any last thoughts? It was a good. Uh, it was a good 30 years. It uh, feels some like somewhat like getting out of jail. And I've heard other guys say that same thing. It was like uh, th being in jail for 30 years. You got to go home at night to your family, but every morning you had to report back in there. And like I said, you, you know, 95% of the people were as close to you as your family. And that other 5% that you really didn't want to be around, but you were forced to be around them every day. So you had to kind of play that out. You know, you had to balance that, you know, not let the 5%, you know, give you a bad attitude and make you hard to work with with the other 95. I, I'm i sure that there was times that my attitude wasn't what it should have been and, and other times that maybe I should have spoke up louder. I don't know, but uh, it was a good place to work and uh, most of the people that I've known out there, I still see them around, you know, and uh, it's still, hey, how you doing? But uh, the camaraderie is going to be hard to replace. That's for sure. And uh, like I say, I've lived within two miles of that building out here, this plant three building. I've lived within two miles of that place all my life. So when they tear it down, maybe I ought to move somewhere else, you know? I've been thinking about that. So. Is it emotional for you? Just to, will it? Do you think be emotional to see that plant come down? Yeah, I'm sure it will be. Uh, just like I'm sure it was very emotional for the guys at uh, Chevy to watch them tear that place down. You know. Uh, but life goes on. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your time today, Mr. Cooper. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.